network systems and devices, uh, domain five, like we said, uh, it's 15%, so very few questions, but they can make a whole difference whether you get to the passing grade or not. So, uh, and it's a lot of reading uh, and a lot of getting to know vocabulary and how it's used. So uh, what they say in your ETS is that you need to understand and apply no knowledge of networks. Uh, so you need to know the components of network, identify network hard, uh, hardware devices and their functions, and be able to describe possible abstraction models of networks. So what is a network? A network is a digital telecommunications network for sharing resources between nodes, which are computing devices that use a common telecommunication technology. So let's look at some of them. So here we have a couple that we're going to look at. Uh, and we, st we can start with one, which is a wide area network. It's a telecommunication network that extends over a large geographical area for the primary purpose of compu uh, computer networking. Then we have a LAN, which is the local area network. And this is the network that interconnects computers within a limited area, such as residential, school, labs, university, campuses, or office buildings. And then we have the internet, the ultimate one. Uh, and it's originally developed by the US uh, Department of Defense to ensure robust and reliable communication in the event of nuclear war and eventually uh, became public. We have Ethernet, a high speed communication system for lands and mans created in the 1980s and is the current technology used worldwide. Uh, it uses fiber optic cables. And, in, and it uses uh, wireless technology and as many other technologies that are out there, but this, the main ones that you're going to uh, focus on are the fiber optics and the wireless. Then we have the router, which is the king of the one, and it connects lands. And a switch, which is the king of the land, and it connects nodes within a LAN, server, computers, and printers, uh, and maintains bandwidth to all used uh, ports and then we have a hub and it contains a LAN not as good as a switch and it dilutes the bandwidth to all used ports. A lot of vocabulary so let's break it down uh, step by step and have a look at a couple. So here is a diagram to show you uh, uh, LAN versus WAN. We know that uh, the LAN is local and the one is, uh, is the wide. So a one can be made of several lands. So it can, uh, like if you have a city and it has all sorts of, uh, like Annapolis connecting to all these other cities in Fredericks and Howard and Baltimore. So you have, you can have uh, a government um, connection that is connecting to all the other maybe state government, so that's a one. So you have little uh, nodes of lands that are connecting there. And then how does it work? Uh, here you, we have the internet and then we have a router and that's your one and that's your land. And the kind of things that connect to a land, your laptops, your wireless, your, uh, your gaming and your uh, desktops. So that's just a diagram to explain to you the land versus the one. And then let's go ahead and look at the internet versus the ethernet. So the internet is a worldwide packet switching network. Since it's based on packets and uh, ethernet delivers the packets that carry the internet that most people encounter. So that is the ethernet within one building and the internet is carried by ethernet, but over longer distance, uh, and, and then other technologies in between are used. So this diagram shows you where the internet is and it's showing you where the ethernet is and it uses other devices like a hub to connect to uh, other things in your office or in your home because you can use ethernet in ops, uh, different places. 
So if you're asked a question about internet versus ethernet, you, you just need to know that one is um, packet switching while the other one is delivering those packets. Then we have hubs uh, versus routers versus the switch. What is that? So here I have a diagram for you that shows you what a hub looks like. Nowadays, most hubs look like uh, switches also. They are made very thin. Uh, it's just the pins of how things are connected as a little different, but for most part, they look the same. And then you see the router. Most of you have a router at home, and uh, but a lot of schools have them. Nowadays, they are big and they're, con uh, I mean, they're not that big. They're connected on your ceiling in your, in your schools, those white boxes in your schools, your routers and all that, or your wireless. So anyway, a hub and switches are networking devices used to connect PCs or any other devices on the same network. But a router is a device used to connect two or more different networks. A hub is a simple and cheap networking broadcast device that works under the physical layer of OSI. Hmm, what is OSI? I'll make sure you get to know that. And it connects several devices together in a network. While the switch is a multicast networking device that works under data link, layers of the OSI model that connects several devices in a network. While the router is a networking device that works under the network layer of the OSI and is used to connect two or more different networks together. I will pause here while you take a, uh, a breather and look at this information, because next we are going to review whether we understood all that. So review this, and if you want me to go to the slide just before this, we will do that, and then we'll have a couple of questions. Uh, what uh, somebody wants an example? What exam? An example of which one? Be specific. What example? Because uh, this these are the example. The pictures and all that are the example. The first, uh, the very first one I gave you that was the that was uh, that was just the description. And this is an example. It's telling you that a hub is a, sim a simple and cheap network that broadcasts, uh, that works under the physical layer. And I have, you, you find those in your, in your classrooms, like whenever you're having uh, your computers, if your computers are connected together and then by the end of the table, you have this uh, little box there that the computers are connected in that, in that jack, that is your, like your hub, but your switch is like where you, you will find it mainly in the rooms where they are doing, uh, where are information going? Where are they being uh, redirected to? So that's what you'll find a switch doing, redirecting and all that. And then the router, of course, it's a broadcast. It's getting the information from your uh, provider and then it's broadcasting that information. So in my school, we have classrooms that have computers that are daisy chained together and they have, they hook to the wall. You're saying that the wall jack is the hub. Uh, uh, it, usually if you, if you're not seeing, uh, if you're not seeing something right there, then you do not have a hub. Most likely you're connected, they're using an internet and then your other connections will be somewhere else. In some classes, like when I taught in Baltimore County, we actually had a hub at the end of each row of desks. You had a hub. But if okay. you're just having computers connected and then at the end they are connected into the wall, then you're using your ethernet and your other connections will be somewhere else. It's not right there with you. If you don't see a box in your classroom, then you don't have a hub in your classroom. But okay. uh, most classrooms should have a hub there. But if you don't, then 
it's not there because it is a box. You will see a box that has uh, things that you, you connect, like how we used to put the phone long time ago, how we used to put the phone into the wall. Yeah. Yeah, that's how you would be connecting into a hub. So we also have these black boxes with a bunch of openings for like those click in spaces are those hubs or switches uh if uh i that that one might, might be most likely a hub i don't think you have a switch right there in your classroom but i'm not sure okay i, I could check that up for you yeah <laughs> i could check that for you uh so and okay, what's OSI? On to the i'm sorry osi oh we will talk about osi okay. in a minute all right okay so here for those of you who have not encountered osi osi is open systems interconnection it usually starts number one as the physical layer number two as the data link and number three as the network uh, and number four as the transport and number five a session from number one to number five you really don't see those uh opened to your eyes usually you don't interact with those immediately because they are uh at the bottom you do interact with your open open uh operating systems but it's just for for it to bring up your computer that's the way you interact with it but you don't do that much like you do with six and seven which are your service layers which are what you interact with the most so the original osi model consists of seven and the reason they say uh original is because now out there you may find some that go to eight and some that go to ten but you're not uh you're not responsible from that because the information i've seen on ets went to seven so uh so the original one starts with the physical layer right up to the application layer the osi model breaks the various aspects of computer network into seven distinct layers these layers are uh, kind of the layers of an onion each successful layer envelops the layer beneath it hiding its details from the levels above so the osi model is also like an onion in that if you start to feel it uh, to have a look inside you're bound to shed a few tears because unless you're doing uh, networking in the physical hard level there's a lot that goes underneath that layer and what you interact with is six and seven for most of us that's all we need to do i'm a software engineer so i'm more focused on the software part of it. I don't do computer engineering, so I don't deal with the physical part of the computer. Uh, and the OSI model is not a networking standard in the same way that uh, Ethernet or TCIP, which is something you'll look at later. Rather, the OSI is a, mod uh, is a model framework in which the various networks are connected and they interact. So that's what uh, the OSI is. A lot of information that's what this session is about a lot and a lot of information to read and take in so the next thing we are going to look at is the network pathology It's the arrangements of the elements of communication network uh, topology can be used to define or describe the arrangements of various types of telecommunications networks, including com, uh, command and control radio networks, industrial field buses, and computer networks. That's what a topology is, connections. There are several that you can find out there. So you can find basic networks uh, topologies like the ring, the mesh, the star, fully meshed. You have uh, maybe, oops, sorry. <laughs> My computer stopped going away. All righty. You have the line ones, you have a tree one, and you have a bus. So which ones are you most likely responsible for, for this specific 
uh, study for your, uh, for your exam. The ring, which is a network topology, and it's set up in a circular fashion in such a way that it makes a closed loop. This way, data travels around the ring in one direction, and each device on the ring acts as a repeater to keep the signal strong as it travels. Every node is critical, and there is no server present. So all your devices are connected. So let's have a look at that uh, visually, because that's just, so here, that's what you have your, in your computers. So that's the way it would look if that's the network you have. That means that uh, the ring topology, all the nodes are connected in a closed loop. Message travels around in a ring with each node reading those messages addressed to it. The uh, main advantage is one main advantage is uh, the ring is that it can span larger distance. So even though here we have four computers, you can have hundreds of computers. Um, larger than any other types of networks, such as a bus network, because each node uh, regenerates message as they pass through it. But then what is the disadvantage of having all this where each node has to connect? An uh, unidirectional ring, a data packet must pass through all the nodes. So you don't, uh, so if one system is slow, then things are getting slowed because it has to pass through all of them. So the next one we're going to look at is the star. And this network topology consists of a central node to which all other nodes are connected. The star is the most commonly used network topology uh, today. The central hub can be a router. So you could have a router there, a switch, or another computer. So do you see how the questions of a hub or a router can be connected to you, a question on topology. This gives you an example. So this is a star. So let's see it, uh, how it can look in an environment that you, uh, you interact with every day. So the bus topology is the networking, is the central cable, the main wire that connects all devices on a local area network. They usually, they call it a backbone, you know, like it's a backbone. And it, and it uses a local area network, the LAN. Remember we saw the word LAN and now we see here how it's used. And it's inexpensive and easy to install for small networks in a classroom, at home, uh, a small office. So internet systems uses a bus topology. And the main advantage is that it is easy to connect to computers or devices and typically, it requires less cable than a star topology. So, because it will have that big wire, and then you just have the fewer ones that are going through it. But then, oops. But then the main disadvantage is that the entire network, if it shuts down, uh, then there's a break, and the wire can be difficult to identify the problem if the, not, uh, if the network is down because you'll have to go through everything. All righty. So that's your bus topology. So with all that information, let's take a break, read this uh, uh, vocabulary practice, see if you can fill in and once you get them, you can just post them into our chat right there, or we can uh, talk afterwards. So we'll take a couple of minutes from me doing the talking and you review this vocabulary for a minute. Diane, you should have had some background music. <laughs> You can set that up next time.
All right, we need a couple more minutes or we done? Anybody needs a few more minutes? All right. Uh, who was it who had asked me about whether those uh, things changing lights on and off and on off in your classroom? Who had asked that question? Dan, do you remember? I think it was me, Miss uh, Paula Tybert. Oh, Paulette, I just, while you were doing your quiz, I just looked, that's, like I said, that was the hub, that's the hub, and the switch will be, like, outside in the wall thing and all that, so, I was right, wanted to make sure that I didn't give you the wrong information, so I counter checked, and I have a diagram here, so, maybe I'll pin it uh, another time into the, into that, but it is a hub. All right, so what do we have there? Let's see, Thomas, do the first four. Can you repeat that? Uh, go ahead and do the first four. Give us the answers to the first four. I see you've posted. Okay, uh, so give the answers. I, I have them, okay. Um, so number one is E. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, you are correct. Okay. Uh, oh, I was thinking you were going to oh. read them because as you oh, read, read them, them like, oh, okay. internet, and that way because we are kind of reviewing before we move on. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, the cloud ultimate WAN in which functions all world networking elements. And so I said E. Yes. Um, that would be the internet. Um, so just go through four of them, right? Yes, yeah. the first four. Okay. So a device which connects LANs in to WANs, um, I said was a router. Mm -hmm. e, uh, newer style device connecting local devices to a LAN. Um, and I said that was a switch. Yes, it's the newer. <laughs> All right. and, and then older style device connecting local devices to a LAN, that would be the hub. They have the next person who posted their all their answer there. It looks like it's Mike. Mike, can you give us the next four, please? Uh, sure can. Uh, the primary land protocol designed for small geographic areas such as homes, schools, offices, buses, centrally located public areas. I said H Ethernet. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, and then the network topology question six network topology with a central device connecting separately to each device that is the a star yes <laughs> diane's helping over there and the next one <laughs> and network topology connecting devices along a single wire for number seven that would be f of bus yes uh-huh the backbone yeah uh-huh and number eight, network topology connecting devices in a circular formation would be eight, would be C, the ring. Uh-huh. Fantastic. So we got them. Let's put that clap in hand. Thank you very much. So, uh, anybody has a question or had two or three that kind of were confusing before we move on? All right, we move on. Now we are going to talk about network functionality. So several terms are used when describing the effective performance of a network or their lack of. So all who use networks are interested in one primary factor. How fast can we get this information loaded, yeah? Processing and execution completed whether moving from a hard drive or parts of a local computing system or just transferring your files to your flash drive. You're like, I need it now. Retrieving a web page from a server or downloading files or installing an application. So we are going to uh, discuss several terms. These are just a few. There are many more out there that you could find regarding performance and functionality of a network. So, the first one we're going to look at is the bandwidth. This is one, the one we all hear, oh, you don't have enough bandwidth. We don't have enough bandwidth in this school. We can't get anything loading up. 
So this is the maximum capacity of medium wire, uh, a capacity of medium, and it uses wire fiber or air along which a signal, uh, a single signal can travel. This does not change, uh, the, uh, but the throughput does. So what is a throughput? So throughput is, uh, is the actual performance of a current time based on the bandwidth. This does change depending on the load. Hmm? What's a load? Is how much signal traffic there is at the current time. And then we have latency, or oh, most people use lag, uh, is how much slow, uh, slow down there is in response to uh, time. And this is a question you could find with uh, uh, a lot of internet information and uh, what companies are doing now, giving a lag if you overuse your system too much. And then there is attenuation, and attenuation is all electronic signals travel at the speed of light. Well, almost, uh, probably around 94% of it according to some electronic hardware expert. This reduction from 100 is due to something called attenuation. So, yes, they are putting 100, but by the time you get to it, how much is there? So these are just a few of those terminologies. Uh, so let's see uh, whether you remember. So now you take a break and put this in the right order. And now let's have two more people uh, apart from uh, Mike and Thomas. Anybody needs more time? Because we can uh, we can go ahead and review and review this and let's see who are we going to call on? <laughs> oh, people would have liked us to have like a hoot or so. Oh, that would have been fun. Would have had music. Oh, that's good. That's good. All right. Let's see. Miss Tibbet, you want to uh, to take this up for us, please? Okay. Um, slowing of response time caused in part by buffering delay within network. I'm gonna. Uh, these are guesses because I'm That's not fine. intimate with these yet. We um, are in a safe place. This is a safe learning place, and we are good with what you have. Okay, so I would say slowing um, refers to lag, which leads me to latency d fantastic yay okay so that's a guess um how much signal is sent onto a network medium i would say load fantastic yay okay um number three actual signal speed along the medium wiber wire fiber air once a i can't see a signal has and then my pictures are has been sent. Uh -huh. has been sent. Uh -huh. um, that sounds like the loading speed. So I'm going to say bandwidth. Is that mm, right? No. Okay. Throughput. Yes. Throughput. Okay. 
Uh -huh. um, and then amount of time a system takes to process a request after it has received it. Uh, response time. Yes. Uh huh. Um, then this one maximum capacity of the medium would be bandwidth. Yes. Uh huh. And then reduction in expected signal speed due to medium resistance would be attenuation. Fantastic. You got them. Great. Very good. You got them. Thank you. I appreciate You're welcome. it. welcome. And sorry for putting you in the spot, but again, this is a safe place. We are learning and debating. No, it's helpful to think it through. Okay. Thank you. All right. Then the next part that we are going to do, and I do give you the answers here, so you have that uh, when, uh, for those who want to review. So the next thing that you're going to have, but we are not going to do today, is you're going to have a lot of a speed test and math, so you'll have a lot of calculation. I'm putting this here so you know that that's going to be part of what you're expected to do. We can uh, calculate in bandwidth, and then some, you might be given uh, a page is so many bits, so how can you calculate that into kilobytes or to the size? And then you're also going to be expected to know how much a picture really eats up memory, so understand the size or, or high resolution as opposed to low resolution. So understand calculating uh, calculation or audio uh, files. I have this here just in case you come across it. We will do this at another time. We did not want to introduce the math part of it now. All right. So the next part that we need to cover is network security. Uh, so characteristics of passwords uh, for the NTSI, uh, NI, NIST uh, industry standard. So the, the standards for how strong your password is are guided by just this one one organization is NIST, but there are many other organizations. But the one we'll cover here is the one that is guided by NIST. Uh, so as far as network security, there are many uh, mainly the questions they have are passwords related and maybe a few things on hacking, but not that much. So passwords are intended to prevent unauthorized access to compute, uh, computers, computing system, or network access location. And the stronger it is, the harder it will be for hackers to break. So the question is, uh, what makes a strong password? There are several criteria uh, on which most experts agree. Length, complexity, randomness, variety of different uh, characters. So let's look at uh, a simple password. So a simple one uh, uh, of another common practice is using simple passwords for everything. That means you have been using the same password for 10 years, you know it, you like it, you just change one or two things every year uh, and make it, yeah, making just slight changes. Uh, an easy process for a person to remember but easy for hackers to discover. Once hackers guess one of your passwords, they will most likely try it again on a variation. And since we all know how many systems, we know Target has been hacked, we know banks have been hacked, we know Facebook has been hacked, we know Microsoft has been hacked, so don't use the same password at all because it's somewhere there. That old 10-year-old password is lying somewhere out there. So strong passwords are typically long. The longer, the better. And they say anything above 15 characters is what is good. So uh, they also contain a random mixture of different characters like digits and letters, upper and lowercase, as well as various symbols, like a dash, like a space, like the, car uh, the carrot, and pretty much anything uh, can, uh, that you can find on your keyboard as long as it's not a digit or a letter. That is, you have letters and you have digits, but then use all these other things that are not the common things you use every day. So some websites are going to restrict which symbols you use, but will provide enough options to ensure a strong password. The website will also give you some idea of how strong. You all see how it, it's, it starts maybe with 
red or green and I don't know why my, oops, sorry. This happened the last time too. Let's see what just happened here. At least this time I got to see that it just happened. Oh. I think an email was reminding me of something. Just a moment, sorry about that. Okay, we are back in business. So the webs, uh, I was just telling you that they, they show you maybe red, yellow or green. If you're having red and yellow, your password is not strong enough. So you make it as strong and, and then you'll see the green color and you know that that is a good strong password. And then random. The biggest problem with human generated password is the lack of randomization. I mean, really, how much random can we come up with, which is what is needed for a strong password. It needs to be a series of characters that make absolutely no sense. The more nonsensical it is, the better. Uh, uh, whatsoever, having no hidden or even avert meaning, which might reveal an identity of an account owner or even any result. So how do you come up with random ones? We have passwords generator. There's so many out there and you just Google them and you can find them. Some sites will provide an automatic password generator using the criteria they deem best for a strong password. Use this, the random nature is totally detached from any personal information about you, which will make it difficult for hackers to guess your imagination as hard as you may try. It's most likely not as good as a password generator. And a good, a good thing is if you forget it and you have to request a new password, you just use the generator to give you a new one. And it's good to change your passwords often. So it might seem a little bothersome, but it's a good thing. And now, nowadays, your uh, your web uh, your web pages do keep your passwords for a couple of months before you have to change. Remembering password: the biggest problem with strong random passwords is that they are difficult to remember. Yeah, which is why most people don't use them. They want something easy to remember, which is understandable, but not conducive to network security and safety. There are indeed online password manager systems, uh, and most of you, I'm sure, have seen those. But these are also susceptible to being hacked because hackers are always trying to find out anything that comes online. There's somebody trying to find out how to break it. Uh, so once you're in dead water and totally open to hackers' invasion, so password phrases these days those have become. Um, really uh, acceptable, but you have to make sure you're not using that phrase. Like let, let's say you're, you're, you're saying uh, as hot as the desert. Maybe you want to use desert, uh, hot, something else in between. And by the way, anything that has a space between becomes really difficult for hackers to hack because it's not as easy to break codes that have spaces in it. Even your own password, if you put a space in it, it becomes like a tranquilian harder time to break than it is usually. So here is a phrase like, whose would this are I think I know. I think that is easily guessable, but something like that. Or banana, rock, puppy, guitar, boat. That's another phrase. For example, these are long, making them very difficult for hackers to crack, but have some, uh, some meaning to you. So if you could find some phrase that has meaning to you, and then you completely corrupt it, mix it up, and only you know how, then that is going to be a good, a good password. Not all websites are going to allow you that. Like your school, your schools may have just decided they only want so much. They don't want to have been crazy stuff. So. Uh, so general security measures. So common sense is what we sh uh, should govern our action and choices when using secure, uh, secure system and deciding which websites, uh, I mean web uh, passwords to use. For example, when you're not actively using your system, log off. 
some people never log off their system. That's a bad thing. You should try and aim to log off your system as often as possible. Uh, when it's idle, that's when people are able to get in there and do stuff. And lock your screen, shut down, and totally disconnect your device from the network. That is the most secure thing. Getting off the network, giving your system a break, that's really good. Okay. Uh, so by disconnecting your computer from your local uh, Wi-Fi on unplugging uh, the network from your device, that's going to really help you. And then create passwords that are truly random, hard to remember or guess, and record them in your notebook. Huh. That's a good thing, but never take that notebook out of your house. If you're going to be taking your notebook anywhere with you, then you're not secure. Your notebook should be just there for you to get your password, log in, and be on your way. But if you're going to carry it anywhere where you could drop it, where your things could be stolen, then it's not secure. Because anything on a piece of paper is not going to be hacked. But you cannot take it to your office, outside your door. Once you leave your house, then... That is, no, that is no longer secure. So two-factor authentication, remember that word authentication, we had that in the security pillars. A new security trend is, uh, is described uh, called two-factor authentication, which many companies and organizations and schools are using now. They provide an extra layer of security to the password process. It involves a second step beyond entering your password. So when, when you enter your password, you're prompted to uh, send a push, a notification to a second device, a smartphone, or an email, and you have to approve to get into your password. This has become very common. A lot of other companies have systems that generate uh, random numbers that, and, and keys that you have to enter to log in. So those are other good ways, having a second authentication method. All right, a lot of talking, a lot of things to read. So take a breather now and see if you can answer this practice. And now we'll get somebody else to talk. We've already had Ms. Tibbet, Thomas, and Mike. We're in a safe place. Oops, people are still working on this one. Oh, oops. <laughs> All right, who wants to take this up? I will. Uh, I, who is that? I, um, it's Annie Okusoyan. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to try. So, sure. random, completely random, devoid of any meaning. Uh huh. Um, as as meant, well, uh, I say as many characters as possible, a mixture of alpha, alphanumeric and symbolic characters. Those are fantastic. The the you got that it. I That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, because really, we don't want based on personal information, you know because your personal information is somewhere out there. And then uh, less than eight characters, most systems won't even allow you to do that anymore. You can't, I don't think anybody will allow you to have anything less than eight characters. And then easy to remember, easy come, easy goes. So we do not want that. <laughs> okay. And then I have uh, one that has the answers there for you. Next one. Let's see who will take this one. For the list, uh, for the item listed below, check each representing a strong security measure. Like the industry standards. This one, 
if we had time, Diane, this would have been good for them to go into a room and discuss. <laughs> I can try this one. You'll take this. Let's give them a, a, a few more minutes. Okay. And then, uh, but thank you so much. And who was that? Claudia. All right. Anybody needs a few more minutes? All right, Ms. Anya, uh, take it away. All right, good morning, everyone. All right, let me try this. So from the items below, check each representing a strong security measure. Change uh, passwords often, yes. Yes. Log off computer system during inactive time, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. Keep password written on a paper inside your office drawer for handy accent. No, no. <laughs> you said no. no. <laughs> in your office, no. No, no. In your yeah. home in your drawer, which your kids don't have access to, then yeah. maybe, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can't, as so long as it goes out of your door in your house, then yes. that's never secure. Yes. It should never leave your house. <laughs> All right, completely disconnect computing, computing systems from network during inactivity, yes. Creating truly random password with no associated meaning, yes. When changing passwords, make a new one, just one character different than the previous one. Uh, this is kind of like a yes or no, both. Sometimes we, in our classes, we learn that make a base password and change the last or first characters to, so you can remember that. All right, remember what the industry standards told us. If Target yeah. got hacked and they have your password. Yes, base they, password and they, then. They can regenerate those other characters very quickly. Yeah. So yes. for industry so, standard, we say no, yes. but most I of us use this. <laughs> Yeah, industry says now that because changing that, because these days now, like, they have very sophisticated password cracking tools. Uh -huh. Very sophisticated, so they can do anything in, yeah. mm -hmm. in a matter of seconds, minutes, and hours, you know. Yeah. All right, use two-factor authentication, yes, mm -hmm. as needed at a layer of security. Using long passphrases to improve password length, strength, yes. Keep a log of all passwords in a book in a secure location only known to you. Yes. But that's not necessary. I mean, like, it's, you don't yeah. need to have all the passwords. If, like, uh, maybe last two would be fine because sometimes systems ask you, okay, what was your last password? Mm -hmm. But, like, if you're changing every two months, that's a lot of data that you need to secure, you know. What do yeah. you but you know when they're talking about this remember they're talking to the whole populace yeah? yeah so we do have some people who maybe that would be needed but for us we know you don't need that yes. but there is some people that maybe they might need that notebook but we want to make sure if they do use that notebook to never leave the house that's it, the only reason that is there yes. it's because people do it yes but mo for most of us in the uh, in, not in the industry, in the academia, or we know that there are so many other ways to do that. But they've said uh, some systems that if you have a, a system where you, uh, you're saving passwords, there are people out there trying to break those also. Yes. So you just keep having a new password generated every time you want to. Yes. All right, very good. And for Last. those of you, who? Last one is create password easy uh, for you to remember. I have a tip for that. Like for example, if you want to create a password, like I love security, so I can be number one, L-O-O -O can be zero, 
and S for security can be dollar sign. So we can mix and match a phrase that we can remember and put multi-character in there. In the place of A, you know, we can have, you know, alpha sign, stuff like that. But thank you very much for letting me answer this. <laughs> you're welcome. But I would say with the industry, if you're taking an industry test, they will not want you to answer that as correct. Uh, creating password easy uh, for you to remember, they say, most likely, if it's easy for you to remember, it's easily hackable. So the, uh, that one is eliminated, but I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And here are the answers for those of you who we might have moved a little too fast for you here, there. So at your own time, you can look at those based on the industry uh, standards. Remember, all these can have a, a maybe, but we are just going with the standards. All right. So that's what I had for you today. So any questions, any other discussions?